Okay, we're getting started. I got an interesting note from Ellen Lanelon uh, a week or so ago. She has uh, one of the most interesting genealogies that I've ever imagined. Uh, Ellen's a direct descendant from William the Conqueror. Um, he's the one, of course, who built a fleet of ships, crossed the English Channel, and defeated Harold for the crown of England. And uh, William the Conqueror, of course, is the one who brought the new language to England, French, in uh, 1066. But uh, also, also doubly interesting because Harold, who was the uh, temporary king, uh, and William the Conqueror are both direct great, 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 great grandfathers of Ellen, the most remarkable genealogy. Um, but they were two claimants to the throne of England uh, and both had um, sort of distant claims. Um, last week, quick review, last week we uh, saw the amazing story of Arminius, the German, the German uh, chieftain, it was a war chieftain, who was a Roman citizen, highly trusted, very successful Roman commander, but he was a German at heart. He organized and led the most extraordinary rebellion against Rome and was able to totally defeat and destroy a large Roman army that is three legions. They were seduced up into the dark woods of Teutoburg Forest in Germany. So he destroyed vir uh, virtually every single one of the 15, more than 15,000 Germans. Anyway, I... Uh, Romans. Um, his name, I failed, I kept calling him Arminius, which is his name given by the Romans. But I, I didn't mention uh, enough his German name. Anybody know his German name? Yes, it was Hermann, Hermann the German, <laughs> the other name for uh, Arminius. And then last week we just discussed a bit uh, this, the uh, crisis going on in Ukraine. Um, and then the next day, the Putin invaded. But the um, point was some background that the Russian state had begun in Kiev area, Kiev, down in Ukraine. And for 400 years, that's where the Russian state was before it moved up to Moscow, Moscow and the uh, Golden Ring. Uh, and Putin understands that distant connection, the deep roots of the Russian state. But what Putin did not understand was that the Ukrainian people are extremely proud of their country, extreme, have a great love of their country, are very proud of their democracy of the last eight years. And uh, the fact that Many Ukrainians are willing to fight and die for the country. Um, and right at the time of the invasion, men and women both in the Ukraine were uh, encouraged to join the military and they were handed out thousands of rifles, other weapons, which they've been using to shoot the tires off the uh, oil, tr uh, the uh, gasoline trucks and other vehicles. The President Zelensky and his family and the members of Parliament have an, announced very publicly, national television to everybody, that they, the President, is not running away. The members of the Parliament are not running away. They are staying there on duty um, if, uh, to die if necessary. And of course, the whole world has a totally new image of Ukrainians as being incredibly uh, 
uh, courageous, patriotic to their democracy. And of course, Putin has been, for a decade or two, has been undermining the democracies in Europe with uh, on the social, social media platforms. In any case, um, today's subject, so far in the class, we have not done almost no, nothing chronologically has been my topic. Today, we're going chronologically. We'll be going from about to year 380 up to about 900. So fasten your seat belts. <laughs> So the question is, uh, of the major Germanic tribes, the migrations, uh, which one was the most important in the long run of history? And of course, you remember that the, the major tribes and nations were the uh, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Vandals, the Franks, and the uh, Saxons. The most important of these in the long run was the Frankish people. Why is that? Let's take a look at the map. <clears throat> um, the Frankish people are the ones located over in the far west uh, this, on both sides. Here you see Germania, the West Franks, including the ones here in, put the arrow pointer over here, please, mm -hmm. on the Germania and Belgica. That area was heavily populated with the Frank, the Germans who were the Frankish uh, nation of the Germans. Now, <clears throat> how did they become the most important in the long run of history? <clears throat> because the Franks, for centuries, they were, quote, friends of the Roman traders and the Roman markets. Uh, Frankish people, were thousand, many thousands uh, became dependent on the trade goods, manufactured goods. Um, many of them, of course, thousands became citizens. Roman citizens became soldiers uh, in the legions. Uh, they had many good jobs uh, as Roman officials. Uh, in short, Many of the Germans of the <clears throat> Frankish tribe enjoyed being Romans. These were German Romans. Um, there were many hundreds of features of the um, civilized life that the uh, Frankish really enjoyed. Hundreds of details like uh, enjoying caviar from the Caspian Sea for dinner, fine wines from the uh, vineyard countries of Rome. They enjoyed entertainments in the theaters, um, entertainment in the Colosseums. Um, in short, now, now this next picture is an example of how startling uh, a Roman city was to say, New Germans who had come, come down into the Roman city. This is the famous public baths of Caracalla, built by the Emperor Caracalla. Uh, but it's a huge, I want to describe a little bit what this is. This is in Rome. Uh, the ruins are substantially uh, still there. But this is a public bath. And this is the sort of thing that uh, the German Romans really. Uh, we're, we're totally startled to discover, for one thing, and really got to enjoy. Um, the public baths, well, around it, you see this two-story uh, structure all the way around. It. Inside there are all kinds of shops, stores, businesses, handball courts. There was a game something like handball that the Romans played, uh, workout uh, centers like the exercise cathedral up in Winthrop, <laughs> um, uh, wrestling, uh, co uh, wrestling competition uh, areas. 
but the centerpiece was this. If you look at the dome with the white over there, that whole that area under the dome was the hot water pool for the public baths. That's the, the Romans would, after they checked in uh, their clothes, uh, they would uh, go first right to the hot water. It's called the Caledarium and bathe themselves in the, and then and they would hang out for hours. A lot of business was transacted there in the hot water pool. And then from there, they could move down to the next area right here. You see the, the what, no, a little higher. Yeah, that area is the uh, tepidarium, the uh, warm, but not hot, and uh, to swim and hang out there for a while. And then they'd move down to the far left right here. And that's the frigidarium, the cold water pool. So this, um, this is quite a different life from the Germans who had grown up living in the dark forests of Germania to come and see this incredible, the, de uh, the details of a civilized life. You can see why many of the Germans loved being Romans. Uh, another thing that uh, they were surprised to see is, uh, okay, now, oh yeah, this picture is a good one. It's an artist's conception of what the, what, this is the uh, frigidarium here, the cold water pool. Mm. And that was the last one that the Romans would uh, get their bodies <laughs> brisk and braced up again to face uh, the outside world. <laughs> and this other uh, big surprise for the Germans was the public toilets. The Romans had flushing toilets. Now this particular one was in uh, Ephesus, the great Roman city in present day Turkey along the Aegean coast. And uh, every neighborhood in the Roman cities had public toilets there instead of in their houses. Um, and the sense of modesty was a bit different among the Romans as it is today. Uh, hard to imagine men or women this is about a 20 seater. Let's see, I counted, I think 10 across. 20 or 20 or 25 seat public toilet. But the water is flowing, or there's a small a canal underneath so that the, these toilets are flushing all the time, 24 hours a day. The Romans built aqueducts. They had plenty of water. <clears throat> the Romans loved using water. Also for public fountains, uh, pure water fountains where the women would bring their um, for a fill up. <clears throat> By the way, the uh, upper class Romans or those of uh, means would send early in the morning, they would send a um, slave down to sit on their seat here and warm it up. <laughs> warm it up so uh, when the slave owner could come down, he'd sit on a nice warm marble seat and start talking, talking with his friends and neighbors. That's where they they did a lot of gossip and learned a lot of the news here in the public toilets in the early morning. <clears throat> Let's go back to the Caracalla. Okay. Um, Oops, sorry. Uh, so all these amazing features of high civilization, and by the way, there's flush toilets the, the ancient Greeks did not have flushing toilets. As civilized as they were, the great cities of like Athens and Corinth, they just had uh, latrines and, and uh, chamber pots, a lot of chamber pots and densely populated. And the same is true all through the Middle Ages. <clears throat> what the European Christendom, European Christendom did not have flush toilets. They had, uh, they used uh, latrines and chamber pots. In fact, the city of London did not have flush toilets until after 1860, hmm. 1860. And it was the 1870s before most households in London got flush toilets. So the, look at the contrast here. The, the ancient Germans coming out of the German woods, uh, living in Roman cities had flush toilets that did not exist again for 2,000 years in civilized 
Christian Europe, Western Europe, quite amazing. Um, <clears throat> all through the Middle Ages, <clears throat> in ancient Greece and all through the Middle Ages, um, in, the, in the towns, uh, the Euro Europeans used chamber pots principally. <clears throat> and in the morning, the person would pick up the chamber pot and pitch the contents out the window. Uh, and this could be hazardous for a early person get, uh, out for a morning walk. It was entirely possible <coughs> if you're walking along the streets in, uh, in, in the morning, one of these medieval cities, to catch a gob of uh, Never feces <laughs> in the side of your head. <clears throat> Diana is the censor here on my <laughs> right elbow. <clears throat> so if you wonder why, like all through the Renaissance, <clears throat> Most of the notable figures are painted with uh, broad brimmed hats on their heads. So to avoid the uh, annoyance of getting the contents of the chamber pot landing on your head, <clears throat> broad brimmed hats were became very popular and very <laughs> vogue. <clears throat> so conclusion. Um, the tribal Germans were so awestruck. Picture yourself as a tribal German coming into a Roman city for the first time. Enormous stone buildings, public buildings like temples and uh, basilicas, courtrooms, uh, and public baths like this. Germans exposed to this were totally awestruck. Uh, but the Romans were so civilized. It was like visiting people on a different planet. It really was that different. So, but, uh, now, given that background for the early Germans, <clears throat> how was it that the Frankish people were the most important in the long run of history? They're the ones who carried on a lot of the Roman civilization and culture that they learned by being Romans. Um, but typically, almost all the German tribes were small tribes that were separate, shifting back and forth. Uh, and they had little or no skill at governing. They never were able to form into a large state. And finally, big moment in history, uh, one of the German leaders was able to achieve the impossible. One tribal chieftain was able to round up, uh, partly through diplomacy, partly through arms, um, was able to form a state. That, Go back, go back. I forgot. You want to go where you want to go? No. Okay, a back something I forgot to add <laughs> about the public toilets. Um, our uh, history group from from uh, the Metau here, uh, we visited the extraordinary Roman city of Ephesus, including the uh, public toilets. This is Egon Steinebach, you might recognize. And then also, this next one is John Sullivan, a teenager. It was really fun to have on our trip to Greece, Turkey, and the Greek island. Uh, <clears throat> and later on, uh, also, I, when I was working as a historian with the Smithsonian, uh, we always visited Ephesus. Um, uh, including the uh, the ruins of their baths. It's one of a, a great sprawling ruins. And uh, also, but in the in the group uh, with the Smithsonian travelers, uh, on one of the trips, uh, there was a, a notable cartoonist, uh, Chuck Stiles by name. He was syndicated, a pretty well-known mm -hmm. cartoonist. And on this trip, he drew uh, cartoon versions of many of the places we visited, 
like the public toilets. Here on the right, you see the Smithsonian group. <laughs> and on the left, his uh, white marble statues of the ancients, spirits of the ancients. It was amazing. Uh, you see the Corinth, the, the ionic column in the center there. And then the, uh, another of his cartoons, he, uh, whenever we came to, this is myself, the ragtime piano player, whenever we came to a hotel that had a piano, which many did um, in uh, Greece and the coast of Turkey, uh, I, I would, after dinner, I'd play some tunes and the group would uh, do sing-alongs. We had a little beer drinking and uh, sing-along. By the way, that cup on top of the piano is not coffee, that is Ovaltine. <laughs> Okay, now, um, now this, uh, the, the person who, find, the one tribal chieftain who was able to organize an actual political state. Uh, he began the Merovingian, Merovingian uh, dynasty is Clovis, King Clovis the first. Amazing achievement. Um, so the Franks had learned enough from the Romans about how to govern people, how to operate the machinery of government. And then Clovis married, the next picture, he married uh, a Catholic princess. This is Clovis on the right. The left is the princess of Burgundy, Clotilda. She was a Catholic and she pressured her husband for years and finally persuaded him to be baptized a Catholic. This is Bishop Remigius in the center. And this was a, an important moment in history because um, by being baptized as a Catholic, Clovis um, was encouraged, he was able to and encouraged to spread his kingdom among the, the uh, Catholics, as opposed to the Aryan heretics uh, who were numerous in Western Europe. Um, so with the total support and encouragement of the Catholic bishops, the Catholic church, um, Clovis was able to con convert, uh, well, or to uh, conquer virtually all of Gaul um, yes, now here's a map of uh, the Merovingian kingdom or the Frankish territory. This is uh, during Clovis's time. The dark green, Austrasia, is the heartland of King Clovis. Um, and this is, uh, and then the, to the left, yeah, and then the left part, that he, Clovis added to the kingdom, and then Aquitaine down here, all a bit, almost all the way to the Pyrenees Mountains, and also Suabia over here on the right. So that, that was the kingdom of Clovis, the first uh, stable, organized kingdom under a German ruler. So it was a huge advance. So what Clovis did was to unite the tribal Franks under the banner of one rule, one single rule, which was the kingdom was blessed by the highest Christian authority. Uh, many historians consider Clovis the founder of France itself. Of course, they're, the name of this uh, group, the Franks, the word slowly evolved into France, from France to France. Uh, uh, to so Paris. to summarize. Uh, Near Paris. Want to go to Paris? Oh, yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, Clovis moved his capital down to Paris. See, it was up here in, to the north moved it down to Paris on the Seine River. And here we have a picture of Paris at this time. 
here his parents in the uh, fifth century. You recognize the arrow here on the Ile de la Cité. That was the original homeland at the start, the home of Paris, where, of course, Notre Dame Cathedral is, and the statue of Henry IV. Uh, anyway, and then the, the medieval city, actually the Romans, the medieval city expanded here. So this became the capital of Clovis, of the Clovis' empire. <clears throat> so, why was this an important moment in history? Because a German, you have a German king, a Germanic king of the Franks, he was crowned as the first German, the first German king that was formed. Now, what was his government, his administration like? Uh, first of all, I guess we must go back to the previous one. Yeah, again, here we have the, the map of the kingdom of Clover. So what was his government like? Well, when, when the Roman Empire collapsed, as the, the structure, the Roman government collapsed, it left an enormous void, of course, and that void was filled by the Catholic Church. That is, the uh, Pope and the Catholic bishops all over Western Europe uh, uh, now had a structure, the, the bishops and the Pope had a model of a structure of government, which was the political government of the Roman Empire. So they cut, they used the same structure with uh, bishops all over Christendom. And the bishop was responsible. Every diocese uh, district had a bishop and they were all responsible to the Pope in Rome. Uh, um, So when uh, Clovis became king, was supported by the Catholic Church, he had a built-in model for his own government, which was the model of the Catholic, Catholic hierarchy, and which of course is based on the Roman experience with government. So here, here's what the model was like. Um, Martel. Yeah. Okay, was the model. Um, Clovis appointed experienced men descended from the Gallo Romans, the French Romans, the ones whose families had been bureaucrats, had been government civil servants for decades. Um, and they were called the comites. In English, there's no real, no really good word, but we're going to use the term counts. So these were counts. And their districts were oh, roughly, very roughly like uh, counties in the United States. You have a county seat um, where the bishop and, and the and or the count uh, resided with territory around the city. Um, so, uh, and the count is the one who is responsible for doing the work of government. It was also called a major domo, the major domo. Um, his job was, he had a tremendous amount of authority because his job was collecting taxes. He raised troops. He heard lawsuits as a judge. So he acted as a judge and he enforced justice. In other words, he was the chief police officer of the realm of the, of the uh, county. So the major domo really was the one who carried on <clears throat> the Roman government tradition. Well, King Clovis, uh, the ruler of this heavy grain area, his dynasty continued on for about 150 years, but then it fizzled out. The last few decades, Clovis's descendants were weak leaders, ineffective leaders, feeble. So they still had the title of king, 
but the actual power had shifted almost totally to the king's civil servants, the major domo, the count. <clears throat> and one, the most important of these was Charles Martel. Uh, there, Charles Martel was a major domo. <clears throat> uh, and he, uh, by the way, the translation of major domo would be the mayor of the palace. Now that is, that's a very unheroic title for this very important position. But Charles Martel uh, was an extraordinary leader and also had a political vision. He could tell that um, France uh, was being was about to be attacked, and there was an invading army that had swept 4,000 miles and was heading north into Frankish territory. Um, let's go to the map. And that invading army was the Arabs or Islam. If you go to the homeland, Medina, Mecca and Medina, uh, just two years after Muhammad died, the uh, the Muslims, 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 Mohammedans, Islamic people, they were so fired with the new religion, the new culture, that they burst out of Arabia to the north. They conquered half the Byzantine Empire over to the east, conquered the Persian Empire, the entire Persian Empire. But for our purposes, take a look at this. They marched rather on horseback. They charged on horseback across North Africa, a pause at Carthage, and they kept going to all the way across Morocco to the Atlantic Ocean, went across Gibraltar, conquered all the virtually all of Iberia, today's Spain and Portugal, crossed the Pyrenees up into the kingdom of the Frankish people. This is about 4,000 miles of where they had been unstoppable. Now here's a huge moment in history when Charles Martel had the vision, he was not a king, but he actually carried out all the duties of the king. He was a virtual king of the Frankish people. He had raised an army, trained the army, and finally, he was able to face this tidal wave of Muslims at the famous Battle of Tours. Uh, today, it's called Poitiers on the map. You see, it's Poitiers, but it's the old, the original name was Tours, T-O-U-R-S. The year was 732. Frankish people were able to stop and turn back. You see the arrow to turn them back across the Pyrenees. And of course they stayed, they occupied Spain and Portugal for almost 800 years. But they were something, conceivably, they, although they were uh, reaching their outer limits, conceivable that this tidal wave could have swept all the way up through Western Europe. So Charles Martel, this was a huge moment in history. Um, when Charles Martel died, his son did become the king of the Frankish people. His son was Pepin the Short. Let's we'll see a picture of Pepin. Oh, just a minute. This is important. This is Charles Martel leading his army. By the way, what does the word Martel mean? French word means the hammer, Charles the hammer. And notice the warriors on the right. Uh, they're wearing turbans around their heads, uh, these two. So these are the Muslim invaders, finally stopped the first time, halfway up France by Charles Martel. Um, okay, now we'll take a look at the uh, Charles Martel's son. Here he is, his name was Pepin the Short. 
Pepin the Short, sometimes known as Pepin the Third. Um, but he was, in fact, anointed the Pope in Rome, um, came north all the way to Gaul to anoint and crown Pepin the Short as the legitimate king of the Frankish people. Now, the, nobody had the authority to create a kingship except the Pope. This was true for many centuries. So Pope Stephen II crowned the son of um, Martel. Uh, Martel. Charles Martel. Um, now that was an important moment. Why? Well, in fact, now politically, here's a question. Why did the Pope in Rome, Pope Stephen II, go to all the way to the trouble to travel up to Gaul, present-day France, and crown, anoint and crown Pepin the king? Why? Well, probably the biggest landowner down in Italy uh, was the Catholic Church, the Pope, the Papal States was a principal landowner and the rivals of the Pope were chipping away at his territory, his lands. And the Pope had no army. The Pope had no army. So he desperately needed a protector and he knew that the uh, Frankish people uh, were capable of helping him. So, and by the way, uh, what did the Franks, what did Pepin the Short have to gain? Why Pepin the Short was desperate to acquire the title of king, the title of king. He was the acting king, but nobody could give him the title except the Pope. So he, he, he was, uh, desperate and by uh, inviting the Pope to crown him, Pepin the Short here became the legitimate crowned king of the Frankish people. Take a look at the, the words if you can see them. Over here is Pepin, his name, and over there on the right, Le Bleff. Pepin Le Bleff, that is Pepin the Short. So he was, uh, and he ruled for 21 years carried on this new line. Um, <clears throat> his most important achievement was he sired a son who was a colossal figure in European history. His son became the greatest ruler of Europe for centuries, the greatest ruler in Europe for all through the entire Middle Ages. And who was that? Charlemagne. This is Charlemagne the Great, um, wearing the king, not only the crown of the king of the Frankish people, but he will become the emperor. Now take a look at the, uh, the words here. This is in, by the way, it's in the new Gothic script uh, created by uh, one of Charlemagne's scholar groups that says Carolus, which is Charles, uh, and over here on the right is Magnus, which is the great, means great. So Charles the Great. Fact, what does the word Charlemagne mean? It means Charles the Great. Um, okay, let's see. What kind of a personality? We know a lot about his personality because more was written. He, he brought back writing on a larger scale. In any case, very interesting personality. He was way over six feet tall. And at that time, that was extraordinary because in an age of low nutrition, the peasant, most of the people in Western Europe really had grain, barley and wheat, so bread was really about the only thing they had. 
uh, until legumes were introduced by the Arabs, by the way, later on. Um, and his father was Pepin the Short. Yeah, look at this contrast. Who was this gigantic figure? He, he stood a head above almost everybody else. And who was his father? Pepin the Short. <laughs> a very interesting uh, genetic. genetic phenomenon there. Um, Charlemagne had uh, was a, was a very tall, he was a superb swimmer. He had a, a strong athletic frame, large impressive eyes. He was a, had a cheerful disposition, good sense of humor, people liked him. He was a, an upbeat, happy person, a very likable man. It seemed that everybody liked him, well, except for the East Saxons. <laughs> so what were his achievements? I mean, extraordinary and long-lasting achievements. First of all, he expanded the boundary uh, of the empire. Here is, this is the empire of Charlemagne, as it says, about the year 800. Uh, it's, uh, the, he took the, the remnants of, uh, of Clovis's empire and expanded it all the way down to and across, uh, yeah, for a while across the Pyrenees Mountains into Iberia. And he, let's go to the next map, it shows um, the diplomacy and arms. Here, this is an interesting map of uh, Charlemagne's empire. He added uh, Saxony up to the northeast, Catalonia, the northern part of the Pyrenees, for a while. Um, and he also added, if we go down toward Italy, he added the city of Venice, which is right up here. Not only the city, but the territory of Venice, the Istrian Peninsula right here, it's kind of shaped like an arrowhead. Charlemagne added that. And this entire coast of Dalmatia, the Dalmatians, the Illyrians, and the island of Corsica. All of those Charlemagne added to his empire. <clears throat> Saxony up here in the north was a real troublemaker. It took Charlemagne 30 years of military. <coughs> he, had, he led 18 military invasions of the, the Saxon people were the hardcore original cultural Germans who loved their German freedom and uh, their German culture and their more like gods and goddesses. But finally, Charlemagne was able to conquer and he enforced Christianity onto the, the Saxon people up here. So they were forcibly converted to Christianity. They had a strength, a stubborn pagan resistance. But near the uh, <clears throat> Nearly all the Germanic peoples now were part of this vast empire of Charlemagne, the Carolingian Empire. Um, <clears throat> so there were two government structures, it, basically the same administrative government structure as Clovis had created, but Charlemagne had almost what amounted to two separate governments or his empire, besides the, the government of uh, the political government of the countships, um, also the structure of the Catholic Church, the bishops, they had a, their own structure, which was based on ancient Rome. So Charlemagne had these two governments and they could keep an eye on each other. Very clever. Uh, the next picture, another great achievement of Charlemagne was this. He was, he, uh, Charlemagne went to Rome with his retinue, of course, 
and he was crowned not uh, well he was crowned king of the Frankish people but much more importantly he was crowned emperor the pope created a political entity called the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and he crowned Charlemagne as the emperor of a new empire created and sanctioned by the Pope Leo III, Pope Leo III. Uh, um, so this, this was a, by the way, the Pope had no authority. At this time, uh, Western Europe, most of Western Europe was still under the title of the Byzantine Empire, emperors in Constantinople, descended from uh, the Roman Emperor Constantine. So legally, the Byzantine emperors were the only ones that could be called emperors. And what the Pope did, this was a, a real rupture between uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, Greek Orthodox, uh, the Byzantine Empire, and the Western Empire, I mean, the Western uh, Christendom under the Popes. So, uh, so what was, uh, so why was this such an important moment? Because Pope Leo III here is symbolizing the Pope's right to crown sovereigns in Europe. He made that official and legal and made it stick through the Middle Ages, through the later Middle Ages for centuries. And of course, the Pope is the only one who could create a kingship. Uh, and this, according to this moment, the coronation also symbolized the emperor's role as protector of the Roman Catholic Church. So Charlemagne with his armies were the protector of the Christian religion. Uh, uh, and the Holy Roman Empire was centered in Northern Europe, which included the lands of the German people. So the German people here are making a huge advance Charlemagne, of course, himself is a Germanic, ethnic German, and he's making nearly all of Northern Europe uh, an empire of the German peoples. Uh. Uh, one other achievement, besides being crowned emperor, besides expanding his empire to the largest kingdom um, for many centuries. Um, this was important also. Charlemagne was determined to bring back learning. Uh, I don't have another picture of the coronation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I forgot that. The, uh, the, the picture you just saw, let's go back to it for a second. The Pope crowning Charlemagne. This, is, this picture is not historically accurate because Charlemagne was not crowned in, up in the front, inside the church, St. Peter's Basilica, but right at the front gates of the church. So the church, the church world's on your right, the outer political world on the left. And today, so this is where the ceremony actually took place. And today, and those of us who visited Rome, there are quite, a, there are quite a few of you, right in the marble floor, there's a disc, like the disc you see right in front of Charlemagne, a historic marker saying that this, it's like this disc, but it's uh, behind me a little bit. This, uh, these two discs are in, in the church, but right behind me, at the gate, that's where the historic disc is, which uh, many of us have, have pointed that out to us. Um, so, uh, what's the next picture? Learning. Let's go back. Um, Where? A couple. Yeah, right there. So, what Charlemagne did also 
he was determined to bring back learning. Uh, several reasons. He he loved the fact that he was considered himself the embodiment of the ancient Roman Empire. In fact, it was he encouraged this title, his new title as Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, so he brought back a lot of the Roman, in fact, his motto was Restitutio Romani Imperii, the restoration of the ancient Roman Empire. Um, of course, he spoke Latin. That, that was the universal language on the continent this time. But also, Charlemagne created a literate, small scale, a literate clergy, um, members of the church, learned to read and write, partly because for his administration, his government, he needed a literate staff to run his government. That was only one reason. But um, so what Charlemagne did, he invited a small number of scholars from all across the empire. There were only about, about eight or nine of them, the leading scholars who were very literate, could read and write, churchmen, of course. Um, the most important of these scholars was Alquin. Alquin, he came from York in England. Um, down to the capital, Charlemagne's capital was at Aachen, Aachen in, in present day Germany. That's where and, uh, Charlemagne built a big stone Roman style building as his palace. So he appointed Alquin as the head of the palace school at Aachen. And Alquin created a school there, became the center of the liberal arts the Center for Copying Manuscripts. Uh, Charlemagne also established seven scriptoria, seven monasteries with trained copyists uh, across his empire. But the most important one was right here in Aachen. Um, and what these scholars did, they, they they expanded the number of uh, churchmen and monks who could write and read and copy the ancient literature, scriptures, and a lot of the ancient literature of the Greeks and Romans, which would have been lost. So this is a huge, uh, Charlemagne was a bridge in uh, learning between the ancients and modern Europe. Among other things, his scholars invented a new writing feature. <clears throat> Alquin and his team invented the Carolingian minuscule script. The Carolingian minuscule script. What does that mean? That means they invented a whole alphabet of lowercase letters, small letters. Um, they had, to, they had existed before, but the, during the whole Roman period, Roman writing was all capital letters, all capital letters. And uh, that is a pain in the neck if you try to read the Roman, uh, like the pedestals in the Roman Forum and all over the Roman Empire, the letters are all capital and they're all run together as one long, long, long word. Yes. Yes. You have to, it take, it's very slow. For those of us who know, can read Latin, it's very slow reading to translate those chiseled uh, uh, monuments. Uh, so now we have small letters, thanks to Charlemagne's scholarly crew. Also, they wrote on vellum, vellum, which is sheepskin, sometimes calf skin. Uh, but with the small letters, you could get a lot more words written on a page. Now I'm going to show Diana's going to show you something here. Uh, this is a page of the vellum. This is one page of Gregorian chant. Um, 
for which I got, this is one page from a huge book of Gregorian chant, uh, which I got in Northern Italy in Florence. I got to know an antiqu antiquarian, uh, a bookshop there who had some secret shelves with these really old documents. This, this was written, of course, by hand, by monks, and there are only two capital letters on here, but all the, take a look at the capital S, it's a, it's a work of art, and then the cap, it's red, and then the blue one, lower down, that blue is a capital I, okay, and look at all the, all the other letter, all the other words on the page are in the Carolingian minuscule script, small letters. And I praise the Lord very often <laughs> <laughs> in gratitude for small letters. It's, uh, it's quite a gift. Um, and that, by the way, that uh, manuscript was on vellum, of course, sheepskin. But that was a huge book originally. Um, <clears throat> And some of the monasteries in Spain and Italy both have fallen on hard times. Uh, so they, they needed funds to keep the monasteries running. So they uh, occasionally would sell off one of their huge books of uh, Gregorian chant. I'm gonna take a look. This was used by for centuries by monks singing. And look at the lower corner right here. Uh, in person, it's darker. But it's brownish, tan and brown, because a monk would turn the page of this. Uh, they sang every day the Gregorian chant, and just the oils from the human skin from the finger, monk's fingers, over the centuries, turned that into a tannish brown. So that that's an illustration. That, by the way, was copied. That was written about the year uh, 1450. It's about 500. 550 years ago. I'm very fortunate to come across that. Um, so Charlemagne himself uh, was extremely important. He had a long rule of 41 years. Uh, and when he finally died, he was succeeded by his son, Louis the Pious. Well, we're going to uh, take a look at Louis. Well, no, we don't have a picture of him. But he, uh, he continued the reign of Charlemagne. Uh, now, not to, for a while, he held the empire together, but he committed what I think was a mistake. He had three sons, three sons. Um, and in other words, Charlemagne had three grandsons who, when, um, who divided up the empire. That is Louis the Pious, Charlemagne's son, announced his, the, the, it was the, the traditional code, the law, uh, tribal law at the time, that when a ruler died, he divided up his domain among his sons. And that's what Lewis did. But he announced the, ter the territory of each too early. <laughs> so, each, um, so take a look at the script along the side here. My, and his three sons were, okay, the three sons of Louis the Pious were Charles, that is Charles the Bald. These are on your outline. Charles the Bald. I was assigned to the green part over on the left, uh, called the Kingdom of Charles, that's the bald. Uh, and Lothar, also spelled L-O-T-H-A-I-R, Lothar was the one actually given the crown and he was given the middle kingdom in the center. Can we, is it easy to go to that other map? 21. No, forget it. Mm -hmm. um, so Lothar was given what's called the Middle Kingdom, 
uh, which included Northern Italy, uh, that is half of Italy. And then on the right, and Louis. Now this is Louis the German. Louis the German was given this orange section. You can see it says the kingdom of Louis, uh, which Charlemagne had united. Charlemagne had spent 41 years conquering, subduing, and uniting all of this vast area of the German peoples. And now his three grandsons have divided it up. And as soon as, uh, as soon as Louis the Pious died, immediately these three sons started squabbling, feuding. They feuded among, among themselves. And that, and that became the unraveling of Charlemagne's great empire. Um, the three sons were feuding among themselves. They even started open fighting and battling each other. And finally, two of them, Charles the Bald on the west, Louis the German on the east, ganged up on uh, Lothair. Uh, they attacked and basically unraveled his middle kingdom. And ever since that time, that area has been, uh, uh, has had political problems. Well, let me go back to the other one. The one in the front. Yeah. Let me go back to the other map. Yeah, th I like this map. It shows Charles the Bald on the left the West, Louis the German on the East, and Lothar in the Middle Kingdom. But the Middle Kingdom didn't have the same, uh, same continuity and the same uh, ethnic makeup. So it uh, disintegrated. It pretty much disintegrated. Uh, it was taken over, territories taken over by the left part, which would become France in the future would become France. And the eastern part of Louis the German, that will in the future become Germany. And the middle section, look at this map right next to us. That middle section, as I say, was uh, very difficult to form into any united kingdom. Now, this map is typical. Uh, this is a map of Germany, and right after World War One. Right after the First World War, you can see what it says under the map, Germany after Versailles, the Treaty of Versailles. So this is the year 1919. And look at the, the Rhineland here. The, it's called the Demilitarized Zone. The Rhineland and this area, Alsace-Lorraine. Alsace-Lorraine. Ever since the grandsons of Charlemagne, this area, which had belonged to Lothair, was never really stable. Um, and this is up, this is takes you up to the 20th century. This is uh, 1200 years later, still the territory, the Middle Lands, still is uh, shifting back and forth. As I mentioned before, Alsace Lorraine right here, uh, the darkest on the left. That shifted we did four to four or possibly five times uh, in the recent in the last four centuries. And finally, finally, to summarize everything today, uh, what have we seen? We've seen that two empires formed by Germans themselves. The Merovingian Empire and the Carolingian Empire, the empires of Clovis and Charlemagne, two great empires had been created by Germans. But both of these empires came apart, came unraveled, and collapsed uh, after one or two centuries. And that, the big picture, that unfortunate cycle continued to be the pattern of German history right down all through the ages.
So if you have any, that wraps it up for today. Um, if you have any observations or questions, it's from Joanne. Oh, okay. Here's a question. Go ahead. Oh, uh, from Joanne uh, Hunold. Regarding Charlemagne, are we sure Pepin the Short was really the baby daddy, the baby's daddy? <laughs> really? <laughs> Interesting question. One, one could be suspicious that uh, Pepin the Short produced one of the tall, uh, a t t tallest leader. Uh, now, the evidence is pretty clear because it was so important to keep a dynasty uh, together and to be known as legitimate that uh, there were numerous watchdogs. Uh, the possibility it, it is considered, historians consider it certain. Uh, And Alexander wrote, um, Alsace got an incredibly rich culinary richness from centuries of shifting dominance. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you, Alexander. Alsace, of course, right in that middle, middle land, the Middle Kingdom, um, shifting back and forth between culture, the French culture, well, starting with the Burgundian culture, the culture was that of Burgundy. Uh, and other smaller areas and shifting between German food and uh, French food, Burgundian food. So it's a, it's a uh, paradise for people who enjoy good taste. And here's also, one. if anyone ever visits Strasbourg, oh. uh, please go to the cathedral and inspect the wonderful uh, clockworks that uh, they have there, uh, along with Bern, uh, with the Zieglockerturm in Bern. Uh, these uh, are some of the oldest mechanical wonders in, in Europe. Ah, yes, thank you. Yeah, Strasbourg is, is a great culinary center. Thank you, Alexander. Quite another question. Yeah, there. Christy Stebbins writes, uh, your outline says Pope Stephen II crowned Charlemagne, but I believe you said Leo III. Are they the same? Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. No, here, Pope Stephen II uh, came up to Gaul and crowned Clovis. Mm -hmm. Pope Stephen II crowned Clovis. If I, if I accidentally said Charlemagne, and of course, Leo III, was a pope who crowned Charlemagne in Rome itself, St. Peter's Basilica. So uh, I don't usually make mistakes like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Diana's correct. Anyway, um, if, uh, if you have your scratch that, let's see. <laughs> um, so, it, yeah, correct that if I, if I didn't make that mistake on the outline. Clovis was crowned by Pope Stephen II. Charlemagne was crowned by Leo III. Thank you very much, Christy. And, uh, and Julianne asks, will you lead a tour to Germany? Oh, thank you, Julianne. It would be so interesting to, to do a couple of weeks, two, three weeks of yeah. important places in Germany. That would be fabulous. However, uh, I pretty much stopped uh, oh, okay. doing, doing overseas trips. Yeah, so, so, well, my, my family names are Brink 